This is Interviews with Technical People with John Robertson and James Havio, a podcast where we interview technical people in STEM fields to discuss the past, present, and future from their perspective. And today we're joined by an old friend, Marie Henderson, a planetary scientist who studies Mars, the moon, and our planet as well. She is currently a science team member on the Mars Science Laboratory mission. Marie, welcome to the show. Thanks, guys. I'm so excited to be here. We are more than thrilled to have a scientist of your caliber on the show, Marie. Um, and, and an old friend. And an old friend of that. <laughs> so we're really excited to hit some of these topics. And I think a lot of people are going to be excited to hear about it. So without further ado, Marie, why don't you go ahead and tell us what you do right now in your own words? All right. So right now I am going through the somewhat daunting task of finishing up my PhD. Um, hopefully I will finish that this fall. And I am earning a PhD at Purdue University in planetary science uh, using uh, spectroscopy to understand our own planet as well as Mars and the moon. What are you trying to understand about our planet? Uh, So I do a lot of volcanology is mostly my focus. And so I I specialize in explosive volcanism. So uh, not just the beautiful... Uh, lava fields that you would see in Hawaii, but the uh, big explosions that you would see that create the big um, volcanic edifices. So I think we can get very in depth into this, but you used a $5 word, which is spectroscopy. Yes. (laughs) That's a scary word. Can you just go into a little, just a little bit of specifically, um, how are spectroscopic measurements made of something like a planet? Yeah. Um, And so spectroscopy is the study of light reflected off of a surface. And so when you're looking at a spectroscopic signature, it just looks like a bunch of squiggly lines. And it's, you first look at that and your immediate thought is how do I pull any information out of this? Um, But what you start to realize is that every single material creates its own spectroscopic signature. And so we have discovered that this is a wonderful tool that we can utilize from orbit of these planets, Um, like the moon, Mars. uh, You can do this all over because these other planets don't have cloud cover like we do on Earth. So this is a technique that's hard to do from orbit on Earth. But Mars and the moon, you can actually um, build instruments that do this from orbit and be able to compare across different planetary bodies and bring that back to ground measurements that we see on Earth. Interesting. But they don't have explosive volcanoes right now. So what do you. Not right now, but the signature still exists. And so the big, um, one of the big indicators of explosive volcanism is glass. Um, And that's because when. A, a volcano erupts, um, it erupts so quickly and explosively that the magma uh, breaks into little pieces and can cool so quickly, and that's how glass is formed. And so glass has a, a signature that you can look for and that you see evidence of on the moon, on on Mars, and then we can see that in um, explosive eruptions here on Earth. So, um, so is this optical spectroscopy? Uh, reflectance. What? You can okay. do reflectance or you can also look into thermal infrared spectroscopy. So you can go anywhere along that electromagnetic spectrum. Um, what, and what do you what do you typically use? What what bands of the spectrum? Um, I usually stay in the visible range uh, for the moon. And that would be like um, like 800 nanometers to like. Uh, that's right. Uh, 3000 nanometers. Okay. Yeah. And that, that's just based on like the, the items of interest just lie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm looking for iron bearing minerals. Um, and so a lot of those, um, they create distinct signatures around, um, the one and two micron bands. And so the thousand nanometer bands and the 2000 nanometer bands. So, and this is the basic, uh, the basis of your PhD research, right? Because you also do work uh, with the Curiosity rover, right? Yes, I do. The Mars Science Laboratory? Yes, that's yes, that's the name of the mission as a whole, which is the Curiosity Laboratory. 
um, the Curiosity rover, and it's called the Mars Science Laboratory because it has um, a suite of different instruments. And actually, within the belly of the rover, it's like taking your own lab to Mars. So you have a uh, a a a GCMS there, a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, as well an X-ray diffraction instrument actually inside the rover. And so it can actually drill down, get some sample, and then put it in. And so it's a traveling laboratory. Amazing. But my job on there is, um, is what I think is the coolest job. It's the job that you guys probably see the most are pictures. Um, so I work with the, the Molly the Molly camera, which is the Mars hand lens imager. So that's not, no, that's not spectroscopy like you do no. the other work. No. So if you ever see those beautiful um, rover selfies, that is the camera that I work on. Those selfies are so cool. Yeah. <laughs> like the, the one. Okay. So when you say work on, who, get, who gets to, to press the button and, and take the photo? Uh, it's not really a button, but it's more of a, we work as a team, um, and my job is to communicate with the scientists and the engineers working that day to decide, uh, to help decide and to help build, we write sequences that get sent to the rover. And so I help um, decide which um, sequences are going to be written by other team members and understanding the scientific intent of taking specific images and so my question for you guys is do you know how how you get those beautiful selfies i i thought it was uh my only memory is the camera turning back on itself and then using a lot of those images to is it that simple together it is it is so you think of curiosity as a person you know it's got it's got its eyeball cameras, it's got a hat, it's got um, a weather station that looks like a bow tie, and then it has this amazing arm that's about uh, six feet long. And on the end of that arm is a is about a hundred pound turret. And so just imagine you have a six foot arm carrying something that's about a hundred pounds at the end. And on that hundred pound turret, there is a little camera, and that's my Molly camera. And so just like you would take a selfie, by putting your arm out and turning it back on yourself, Curiosity, she does the exact same thing. But she can't, um, her arm is not long enough to get the entire rover in the picture. So what ends up happening is about 50 to sometimes even up to 90 of these images are taken. And then here's the big question, you guys. Does your picture of your selfie look better when your arm is in the picture or when it's not? I think it looks better with the arm. I say without. You know, or else it's just a headshot. Yeah, but your arm sort of, maybe we're all not as, as muscular as you, John, that your oh, arm actually cool. looks good. But the normal amount of people, they don't like it when their arm is in there. My arm and, doesn't look as good. <laughs> and so curiosity is the same way. So we just mosaic out the arm every time and put those you know, 50 to 90 images together and make a giant selfie image. So you just take the picture and pretend the arm isn't there. Yeah, so you can mosaic it out every time. And so you just put them all together and overlap out the place where the arm is in the picture. And you said it takes dozens of photos to do this? Mm Mm-hmm, yep. Takes like, uh, normal is like 50, but we've done, you can do a selfie that actually ranges up to 270 degrees um and so it can get its whole background in there too and that one i think took about 92 images what what do you what do you do with that camera besides take selfies oh my favorite question so yeah and so one of the crazy things that it can actually do is that the rover can so we get back to this giant arm this really heavy turret on the end And one of the great assets of this Molly camera is that it takes images so close that you can find the distinction of were these rocks deposited by water or were they deposited by wind. 
And that is done because you can actually study the grain size of these different um, rocks because smaller grain sizes, they're usually transported by water, larger grain sizes transported by wind. So this, let's put back in perspective, this arm that's six feet long with 100 pounds on the end actually gets placed about a centimeter above the surface of, of Mars and can take a image that can get up be about 14 microns per pixel. And so to put that in perspective, that's about each pixel is about the thickness of a piece of hair. And you can actually then determine was this um, water in place or wind in place, which leads to, uh, can help us answer really huge questions about the history of um, habitable environments on Mars. Wow. So what I'm hearing is it's kind of a coincidence that this long arm can take selfies, but because it can take selfies, you're going to take some selfies. Of course, because you know, <laughs> exactly. The scientific part is more important here, but we realize that a camera can be, she's the best, uh, we call Molly the best supporting actress on the mission because she can take these really intricate scientific photos, but yet the part of the rover that goes out into the world and does outreach is you see these selfies and you're amazed. And so that's the part that reaches the public a lot more. And then the science, then you can pull up with the science there. And also Molly, she takes images of almost every other instrument on the, and the wheels and the, um, on the rover itself to sort of check health and safety of all the other instruments as well as the hardware. So it's your diagnostic. Mm-hmm. equipment as well so so ordinarily we would ask this to the guest we would say uh you know marie what is what does a day in your life look like i'm gonna ask a different question what is a day in the life of the mars rover looks like what yeah what, what does it do when it wakes up and goes to bed <laughs> one of my favorite questions does it go um, to bed it does oh. and so the curiosity rover it's sort of because the distance between Earth and Mars is about like 7 to 14 minutes communication, you can't actually do anything in real time because you would just get nothing done in the day. And so you have to plan a day, um, or on Mars you call it a sol, as a single time that the, like a day on Earth, so you have a sunrise and sunset on Mars, and that's about 40 minutes longer than a day on Earth on Mars. So you have a sol is what that's called. So for a single sol... The rover wakes up in the morning, um, and it, it's sometimes easier to start from the other end. So let's start from the other end. So right before, imagine you're about to go to bed, and you call your mom on the phone, and you call her, and you say, this is everything I did today. This is exactly what I've seen. Here's all the information I collected. I'm going to go to sleep. Tell me what to do in the morning. And so you go to sleep. And all of us back here on Earth, the scientists and engineers are like your mother, we look through all of that information, all the pictures, all the data that comes back, and we decide, this is what you should do tomorrow. We're going to build an entire plan and send it. And so while you're sleeping and charging your human battery, the Curiosity rover does the same thing. It has a nuclear power source that charges a battery that powers the rover. And so it charges its battery overnight, wakes up, and it connects back with Earth and asks, what am I going to do today? And we send that plan we made through the Martian night back to the rover. And it's like, all right, I'm going to drill this hole. I'm going to take these pictures. I'm going to shoot with the laser there. And um, I'm going to also drive about 40 meters so we can keep working our way up Mount Sharp. And then it, before it goes to bed, it sends all that information back again. So you can do it all over. And we've been doing that for almost eight years now. So generally, you only send data up once a day and get data back once a day. Uh Sometimes we end up doing about two to four souls at a time, depending now we don't work. We go through, you know, a whole weekend plan or depending on the orientation of Earth and Mars. Um, sometimes it's easier to send two plans at a time because of the time difference that we have there. And you only work during the, or the rover only works during the day, daylight. Exactly. Most so, of the time. Sometimes it does a couple of nighttime operations, but um we have flashlights on our camera, so you can do that, too. Is that because of power limitations on the rover? Like, I know it has the, the RTG, the, the mm -hmm. nuclear power source. So is it because that alone isn't enough to carry out the operations? It needs to charge a battery 
And so it spends about half its time doing that. Like, in other words, could it operate continuously? Um, it does need to take time to op- to fill its battery. It can't charge and do all that. So it does take naps throughout the day sometimes too. But yeah, there are some observations like using um, some of these really intense instruments that like the interior instruments that need to be done through longer periods of time. And uh, like I said, the Molly camera also has LEDs so we can take nighttime pictures as well. It's just you then start trading battery for data for You know, you have to heat the rover to move it at night. And so you end up having to deal with a lot of consumables. And this is sort of a conversation we have every day versus science versus engineering versus data versus power versus complexity of building this plan in the time you have and to send the sequences up to Mars. It's fascinating. A lot that goes into making those plans. (laughs) (laughs) It does. A lot of passion and exciting. And there's about... 450 people on this team from about 14 different countries um, that come together and work as one global team to make these amazing missions in space happen. And I think that's a really beautiful and powerful thing that we can all do to advance science together. So you're you're spending a good amount of time on on the rover. Mm -hmm. And then you're also doing this research with spectroscopic measurements on multiple planets and moons and so forth. So is there, um, is there like a a mutual relationship between these two? Does one feed into the other or are they just different parts of the diverse uh, career that you're building for yourself? Uh, They're both, they, they don't really feed into each other. Um, A lot of this goes back to, my history of how I became part of the Rover team anyways, if you want to get into that now. You know, let's do that. About once an episode, we like to ask the question, how did you get here? And why don't we do that? Yeah. Let's talk about how you got to where you are. And like, you you restart like, you know, why'd you even choose this field of study? And how'd you even decide what college to go to and what to study Mm -hmm. there? Yeah. Let's go to the beginning. Yeah. And that will get us to this answer at the end and help us get to where you want to go there. So so we'll remember where we left off. Yeah. We'll get get there. Um, So I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania called Hermitage. And um, I was the person who loved science from the start. You know, there's the video of me in kindergarten saying, when you grow up, you want to, what do you want to be? And I'm like, an astronomer, a paleontologist, or an archaeologist, and this is me in kindergarten. <laughs> um, so it's always been about science. Went through a couple of um, stages, you know, of wanting to be a forensic pathologist or an ophthalmologist, and realized that it was really always space that kept an interest. And when I was in seventh grade, I went to Disney World, rode that mission space ride. Mm-hmm. And the ride was, it's about going to Mars. And the ride was fine, but the real thing that got me was I walked into the gift store afterwards and realized that I wanted to buy every single thing in there. I wanted every NASA shirt. I wanted every NASA video. I wanted everything to learn about NASA, and that's when it hit me. I want to be an astronaut. Mm -hmm. And so that was seventh grade, and in about 10th grade, I convinced my mom and my grandfather to combine some Christmas and birthday presents and send me to space camp so I can live out that dream and decide, is this something I want to go to college for, that I can actually pursue studying space? And it takes something, I think, to be one of the biggest nerds at space camp, and that was me. <laughs> You're and, one of the biggest nerds at space camp. Yes. Oh, I... Brought black cards of NASA acronyms to space camp. So that way I was prepared for every single acronym that would come up. I am that child. And I loved it. And so that took me to where I met you two. Can can we just pause for a moment? Because I actually don't know what happens in space camp. Yeah. Um, And so what I did back then, there's a couple of different types of programs that that happen at space camp. Uh, there are ones that are more, that are short term, there are longer term ones, there are ones for parents and kids together. But what happens is you spend time in between doing lectures about space history and space science, as well as doing, um, you know, 
mission simulations. And so you actually get to go into the simulators and do a mission from beginning to end, doing the scientific aspects, the engineering, the 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 spacewalks. And then we spent time listening to astronauts would come and give talks and you know, learn to scuba dive and all of these different pieces came together over the two weeks that I was there. Um, and it really just brought in my horizons to, cause I always knew I wanted to be an astronaut. I just didn't know what I wanted to do in the meantime. And it really showed me that I want to study the, the science. I want to study what are the astronauts going to do when they get there? What are, what am I going to do when I get there? Um, oh. That's, that's the dream. Um, and so that's led me to look into a school, the Florence State of Technology, where you guys went as well, and I met you, that was started by, as a resource for people working at Cape Canaveral what, during the Apollo missions. And so this was perfect. I was going to be right near NASA, be able to watch launches, go to a school that had such a space history attached to it that it just, you know, I that was the only school I applied to. That was that was it. That was your only school you applied to. Yeah, I got in before I even finished another application. Didn't fill out any others. I'm glad you went. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're all here together. <laughs> see, Marie and I were in the same major, so uh, I can't see, say that we went through a lot of that together. Yes, we did. Yeah, lots and, of it. And there's a certain camaraderie that comes with spending four years together in university and, and kind of, because we, we got to see that this is where we come into the picture. So we got to see you not only having these goals and dreams, but then putting the work in to actually get there. And I remember that was one thing that stood out to you because so many people say, Oh, I want to be president. I want to be astronaut. But the difference is when people actually put in the work and develop the habits that could get them there, or at least maximize their chances of getting there. And that was always you, which is neat. So you, you stood out in that regard, and then here you are. Yeah, it's a. It gets me emotional sometimes thinking about like where I am now versus where I was because you know you guys saw me get my first NASA internship and then get to at the internship, which led to me working on the Curiosity rover and you know watching, uh, believing that now I have applied to be an astronaut for the second time, and realizing that I'm a acceptable candidate. <laughs> I am a person who meets the qualifications, who has the background, has the ability. And that's really cool to think that this is a dream that I had so long ago and actually have worked to the point that it's, it's out of my hands. It's viable. That's a terrifying and exciting realization. I know. <laughs> it really is. I go back and forth through the roller coaster of emotions with that. So, you know, you, you mentioned that you've now applied for two rounds, right? Two solicitations for the mm -hmm. astronaut application. Yep. When did you when did you do those? When did you meet the minimum qualifications? And actually, this would be an interesting conversation, too. What are the minimum qualifications? Yeah. To be an astronaut? Um, and so right now, the qualifications are to have a they just re they changed for this round. Also, it's to have a bachelor's degree and four years of experience or a higher degree and then also less less experience from that so since at the time that I will would potentially be selected I will have my PhD plus um, since I worked I do have professional experience since I worked at the company that built these cameras there on the Curiosity rover and so that combination with the fact that it's in a, um, a technical related field, um, it's really where the, that starts. And then you can build on top of that with, you know, I do a lot of field work. I have operations experience with working with spacecraft and, uh, you just sort of keep building on top of that to, you know, she's done an Ironman. Maybe she can do a 17, like a giant long-term spacewalk. Do you have to go through medical tests in, yeah. in your application as well? Uh, that comes later. So if you go through the first round, uh, so this is pushed back because of the pandemic right now, but they'll narrow it down to about 150 candidates and they will start going for interviews probably next summer. Um, and that's when they 
get to the point where they'll start doing the medical and everything too. So we'll see. Next summer is going to be a fun time. We have our fingers crossed. Me too. But <laughs> there, yeah. you know, some people have applied and got in like six, you know, some people apply the first, get in the first time they apply. Some people applied for like six to eight times and then get in. So it's not something yeah. that if it doesn't happen now, then maybe it'll still help it happen in the future. So you pointed out even before you graduated college, um, you got an internship, correct? Yep. So, so where does the story go from there? Yeah, so I actually did um, three NASA internships. I did one at the Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, working with Apollo d- data the Apollo astronauts actually collected. They set up instruments on the surface of the moon that collected data, um, understanding like dust and as well as seismometers and everything for almost seven years, we collected that data and trying to... Um, go back and look into that and calibrate it and actually archive it because this was something that never really happened was as NASA was building and learning, uh, there wasn't as much as an archiving process, which now, um, you know, that's a big part of any job is to make sure that the data is accessible, understood, and can be used by the taxpayers. Um, And so going through and restoring some of that data and then that was my first one. My second one is the one that, you know, really made a difference in my life was I was selected to be at JPL when the Curiosity rover landed and being a part of the rover um, landing support team. And that changed my life. I remember with that one, that was a summer position. Mm -hmm. And then it went over into the fall because we were studying a lot of classes together and then you just didn't come back (laughs) for the fall semester. Yeah, well, when you see a rover land on Mars and you're standing in the room with these scientists that help build these instruments and the rover lands and the place just erupts with tears and happiness and hugs and just like this person started building the Kemen instrument the year I was born and just watching that and then the realization hits, there's a rover on Mars and it's not leaving. And so I did... I was standing one day talking to the man who eventually became my boss later on. He's like, when does your internship end? And I was like, oh, it ends about two weeks after the rover lands. It's like, that's the best part. It's on Mars. You can't leave then. And that just sort of hit that switch where all of a sudden I was like, you're right. I can't leave. And I just went to my boss and asked, said, I don't want to go back to school. Can I stay here? There's a rover on Mars. And I was supposed to leave for school on Friday to start school on Monday. Um, You know, and all of a sudden I had an interview on Wednesday, called all my scholarships on Thursday, and I canceled the flight that I was supposed to take back to school on Friday and ended up staying there for three more months to actually experience being a part of the surface operations team um, as the rover was exploring from those first three months so you've been there maybe not from the beginning like not from not from first design but from when it landed Mm -hmm. and that was 2012 was it yeah yeah so i you know i've sort of grown up with this rover from the you know they i was essentially a planetary science baby a person in charge of Um, one of my jobs that I had there was to lead a meeting and click the slides, um, as the, and scientists gave their talks. And that sounds, you know, like a, not a big deal of a job, but that experience of actually networking and meeting those people. And when I didn't know what a scientific term was or anything, and you just lean over the person next to you and just be like, what does that mean? You're, you're at least there when people were talking about it and got to, you know, see exactly. it on that. Exactly. You got there. that networking changed my life. And that person who told me, don't go back to school, uh, when I graduated a semester later than you guys did, um, I reached out and said, do you have any more good advice for me? The advice you gave me last time was great. And he came back and said, why don't you come work for me? And so that took me out to, he was the principal investigator on the 
the Molly instrument, that camera that takes the selfies, which is how I started working at the company that built all those cameras for a year and a half. Wow. And that, so that was right after college. And I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. So that was 2014 to 2015. I did where, that. Where was that? Uh, so it's at a company called Mayland Space Science Systems in San Diego. And so it's this small company and they actually build a lot of the spacecraft cameras. So if you see those pictures from Jupiter coming back that are stunning of the clouds, they build that camera. Those beautiful, um, the LROC, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter cameras that send back the pretty pictures of the moon. They built that camera. They built the cameras that are um, all the cameras you see from the Curiosity rover, the, the the ones that give you the beautiful panoramas as well as the Molly and that I work on and the camera that actually videoed the descent. And they're going to be building more cameras for that for the next rover also. And so they have a really amazing, um, I believe it's still a hundred percent success rate in spacecraft camera operation. Amazing. That's, that's another question that I had. So from the outside, we look like we're really good at getting rovers to Mars. Mm -hmm. And I know that there was probably a long road to get there, but like there's been a lot of rovers that have attempted to land and many have been unsuccessful, but yet, but yet we've landed spirit opportunity mars 2020 i'm going to knock on wood we have one more on the way yeah uh, and, so, yeah sojourner and then yeah march 2020 hopefully mm -hmm. february 19th mm -hmm. yeah and these are you know these are these are just the ones that we know i'm sure there's many others that have come too yeah so, um how how difficult is it to get the rover down there because i know even curiosity had that like rocket assisted landing with mm -hmm. what, what did they call it with a sky crane. A sky crane? Yes. It's a, it's a really crazy thing for all of you who haven't seen it. Um, there's a wonderful YouTube video that goes through it. Um, it's called The Seven Minutes of Terror. And this will be the same exact thing will be happening for March 2020 in February. But it so many things have to happen precisely from launch through launch um, and then through the the cruise from Earth to Mars, you have to always make sure that trajectory is correct. And as you enter Mars's atmosphere, make sure you go in at the correct angle, you're going at the correct speed, your parachute has to open perfectly. Your parachute can only slow you down so much um, because there's not enough atmosphere like we have here on Earth. Mm -hmm. And um, and so you can't even slow all the way down to the surface like you could on Earth here, even though we are at one of the a deeper area of Mars, we were inside a crater. And so we had to also use rockets to push um, against going against gravity there. So going in the opposite direction. And you can't take those rockets all the way down because you'll kick up so much sand and rocks. And, you know, Mars is, Mars is called the red planet. And yes, some of the rocks have a redder tint, but majority of the rocks are gray. That red comes from the dust. It is the red dust planet. And so if you kick up too much of that dust, you will cover all of your instruments and then maybe not be able to mm. do as do as well with operations. And so you have to use um, what you guys are talking about, the sky crane to actually drop you down. It's about, I think they're about 20 meters or something like 20 meters or something like that to actually drop you down the rest of the way so you don't kick up so much. And then it can safely put the wheels down on the surface and then ejects in the other direction to crash land somewhere far, far, far from the rover. And and that all worked. It all worked. <laughs> I, I, can, I only think it has to work because you spend so much money and it's, you know, a six month trip to get there. And I mean, decades of planning. Like, yep. You, but you, also, it has to work. Like, it has to. But, you know, there's a lot of things. You just imagine all the motion that happens during launch all of these different aspects coming together if there's one thing that ends up wrong yeah it can it could be a bad day and they plan for some things like what if it lands with a with some wheels up on the rock on a rock and it can't get down what if it like ends up tilting over and you know this is a brand new method that was definitely thought to be crazy when someone first suggested it because all the other rovers landed in just a giant pack of airbags and bounced until they landed. And this is, uh, 
I remember Spirit and Opportunity just like bowling down. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And Curiosity, it was amazing. And just as we are watching the landing from in there, you get it's all automated at that point. And you just hear beeps that come back at every single stage. And so you just hear a beep and the room erupts and the beep and the room erupts. Then all of a sudden you get the landing beep. And a little bit later, the first image comes up and it was just like. I remember when the, I remember when the first image came through, it was just a thumbnail image with a filter on it, wasn't it? And yep. everybody just lost their mind. Yep. It was just, yeah, that black and white image. You can see Mount Sharp in the background and the shadow of the rover. And it's, oh, wow, we're, we're sitting up straight. That's where we're going. And it was just beautiful and awe-inspiring. So you study the Earth, the Moon, and Mars. Yep. And, among other things. So why Mars? Why, why, does, why has Mars captured our imagination so much and we're sending so many things there and so forth? It's, it is a relatively close place, mm -hmm. but it gives us, if there is a place that really in our lifetime right now, it is our best option for finding evidence of life elsewhere in our solar system just because of the mix of accessibility and also the environment that exists on Mars. You see places that where Mars 2020 is going is this beautiful delta that looks just like the Mississippi River Delta. You see, um, you know, evidence of press, these giant volcanoes, um, the largest volcano in the solar system. It has, and you see there is a possibility that there maybe once was a northern ocean. And you see this, environment that is just it's what we have here on earth but much much further in the future but what's it's not so different from the earth mm -hmm. it yeah. it's not and what's really cool about mars is mars doesn't have the same sort of recycling system like we do here with plate tectonics we lose part of our earth and we lose that history as plate tectonics, you know, s sends a plate back down into the center. There's no more, um, there's not plate tectonics on Mars. And so it actually preserves the history. So it's almost like the oldest rocks that we can see on Mar on Earth right now are, so, you know, within a range of some of the youngest rocks we see on Mars, and then you can go backwards from there. So you actually get this giant span of, knowledge about our solar system and every time we go to another planetary body you learn something about that body but then you turn it around and you learn more about our own planet at the exact same time people forget that about nasa's everything that nasa does is we're learning about the earth and people mm -hmm. and life in general here yeah and and i just want to make this clear there's teams of scientists learning new things and you're on those front lines, right? With yeah, and and they all have you know their own tools that they use. And you mentioned you you use spectroscopic measurements. Mm -hmm. So, um, why don't we tie that in then? So, what what kind of things have you uncovered? What yeah. what do we now know from your work? Um, and so one of the things that I have um. Well, so the first paper that's in the process of being published right now, it works. It's looking at um, different volcanic deposits that are collected from all around Earth that are explosive in nature. And they have the that amount of glass. And I told you that glass is important because you know it's explosive. But also another aspect of that is it requires um, some water component to help increase that explosivity. Um, and so we find have found areas on Mars that have that. Um, those same sort of spectroscopic signatures. Um, and so that way you can know there's, you know, some subsurface water or possibly surface water in play that um, can help create those mineralogical signatures, create that glass. Um, and so that's really cool. And then most of the, my other work is on the moon, which is my first love. You, you guys know this. I love the moon more than anything else itself. That's where I want to go. Mars is too far for me to walk. I want to go to the moon. Um, so you, you worked with uh, NASA on the moon before you worked with NASA on Mars. 
Exactly. And so now the majority of my PhD is um, studying these lunar sites, and they have these giant deposits. They're called lunar pyroclastic deposits, which is just a fancy term for a explosive volcanic deposit, which does have lots of glass. And these um, areas have been found to, they're really high interest areas for um, exploration, human exploration, and other missions to go back to in the future because these glasses that you collect from from these deposits have been found to be the best source of extracting oxygen. And so that's an important part of, you know, going forward is you need to study these volcanic deposits, not just because it teaches you about the subsurface, but because it can help us, you know, in the future and, you know, working on, that's a goal for a lot of people is how can we use our own, you know, lunar resources. At, where, where is the oxygen in the glass? Is it like like earth glass, like silicon dioxide? Mm-hmm. Interesting. Just there on the moon. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. And so I study these areas um, showing that they're glass in these volcanic deposits. Like the Marius Hills is something I'm working on right now, proving that these were explosive volcanic deposits. And this was a place that Apollo, I think it was supposed to be like, 18 or 19 was supposed to go to, but didn't go to. So now it's one very high on the list for a return to the moon. And so my goal was let's go get my PhD, study all the places that we should probably go back to on the moon. And then who will be the person who is knowledgeable, who might be in the astronaut corps and should go there. So Marie knows what she's talking about. (laughs) It's all tied together. This is so perfect. Like, just put the bow around it. Like, oh, we're going here. Who's the world's expert in this stuff? You know, (laughs) it's Marie. Exactly. And you you can use that glass to to separate the silica from the dioxide or the oxygen to get oxygen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so there's a really, there's a paper that, came out, you know, Carl Allen in like 1990, but he went and looked at all the Apollo samples that came back and at the different types of um, oxygen extraction from all the different sites. And Apollo 17 went to one of these pyroclastic deposits and went to a place where there was once a history of explosive volcanism and brought back these beautiful glass beads. Um, And so that's how we know that this method is working. And so you can now tie these um, samples that were brought back from Apollo, we can tie that to what we are seeing from orbit when we look at that exact same spot and use that Mm -hmm. same exact technique to then look somewhere else on the moon to look for similar things. And then you tie it all together and you sort of have a ground truth. That's wow. And so, all right, let's just say you, you, we or someone, or maybe you do go to the moon. Mm-hmm. When we come back, now that we know so much, right? It's been how many years? Gosh, 50 years. Since Over we were there back. Since, since, we since went the back time. and uh, the last time we were there was 1972. Yeah, so we're coming up on 48 years now. Yeah, mm-hmm. two years since uh, Gene Cernan, last one on the yes. moon. Yeah. For the yeah. university, first and last man on the moon. Mm-hmm. Hopefully the first woman on the moon. So... So when we finally go back, we have all of this knowledge. Can you envision us going there and staying now? And, and not not staying necessarily like, you know, condos there, but, you know, having a, a longer term presence there? You know, I think that that is a, a definitely route that can be taken. The One of the hardest part of ex, exploring our solar system is actually getting out of our own planet, getting away from our gravity, getting out of our own atmosphere. And that's the majority of the fuel that's required to get somewhere else. So if we learn to use the moon to our advantage, that allows you to go further, explore more. You can, you know, limit, you don't need as much weight of a spacecraft that has to go to fuel to leave our solar system. You can change it up for scientific instruments. You can change it out for humans. You can change it out for, you know, more fuel that can take you even further than we've ever been before. And so I think that, you know, yes, there's a trend that it might go that way. You know, there's the part of me that is the 
purist that feels as though we must learn the science before we ruin it. Um, feelings before. about Mars and the moon. But, before we turn the moon into like a, a space refueling station. Yeah, because people, well, you know, one of the questions I get asked all the time is we've gone to the moon. We've been there. Why do we need to go back there again? And, you know, my response to that is, okay, we sent five missions there. Total of 300 hours. So, and we went to some of the most boring places on the moon because they are the easiest to land on. So let's, let's think about if this was earth. Okay. Um, so we went to, you know, the mid, like the Arizona desert out in the sand, you went to Siberia, you went to the outback of Australia and you went to like, you know, Northern Canada, you know, these, and maybe Antarctica, these sort of like, or the Sahara Desert, that's a fair one. These are sort of very flat, desolate landscapes. And say you spent 300 hours at all those places. Do you guys think you have seen everything Earth has to offer? Nope. You've been to my hometown, you know. You'd, <laughs> you'd miss out on Maine. You wouldn't catch the Victoria <laughs> trees, which I just visited. There are so many just... The Grand trees. Canyon. The Grand Canyon. Like, totally miss it. Hard to yeah. land a spacecraft in there, too. Exactly. And so that's now just think of the amount of engineering and technology that has increased. And we can actually, you look at, like, you can decrease those landing ellipses. You can get in better places. And so you see that with Mars, the landing ellipse for, like, the first lander was, like, half a planet. And now we have, like, a 20-kilometer ellipse we can land in the inside of a crater. And so you same thing for Mars. Now we can go back and, or for the moon, go back and choose other places that you can learn about impacts and volcanism and um, all these, you know, polar, polar ice and, you know, permanently shadowed regions that might hold some sort of ice. And you can go to these places that were never options during Apollo. Amazing. I think it's time to ask uh, one of the questions that I like to ask is, yeah. so we, we now have an idea of what you do. You've given us all this background and you've already answered it to some extent, but what gets you most excited about the future pertaining to all these things? And also, what are you concerned about in the future? Um, I just, I am really, one of the things that excites me is when there was a period during like, towards the end of this, uh, during the shuttle missions where sort of the inspiration that the world got from space travel was starting to decline. And then all of a sudden curiosity landed and there were watch parties all over the world. You know, there's, it was on the screens in Times Square, New York. And now it's something that I talked to get the chance to talk to school kids and all that. And so just like so many of the people who are my mentors, um, in these positions were inspired by the Apollo era to get into this. We are now in the age where we are starting to inspire the next generation, which is going to take this over. So I'm in that middle spot right now, but um, all these exciting missions, like we're going to potentially be flying a helicopter on Mars on the next mission. Like That's cool. that is insane. And, you know, there, I think what's really cool is, Space exploration and NASA, it requires every single type of person. You need, you don't have to be a scientist or a mathematician or an engineer to be a part of this. There are also PR people. There are, you know, artists who do artist renditions of these planetary bodies. There are people who, you know, sew the spacesuits. People who used to make bras sewed the first spacesuits. There are people who have to be chefs who design the meals that astronauts eat. And it's just, getting the chance to talk about how this is a giant effort that spans every single type of career. Um, I think that that gives me a lot of hope for all the things that we can do in the future. Um, and let's see then. And I think in our lifetime, we're going to see a lot more exploration of some of these, you know, really exciting bodies like the moons of Jupiter and stuff like that. I'm also just going to have a shout out to, I think it's called, the Dragonfly mission or Project Dragonfly, you're familiar with it? 
yeah. which is the, the nuclear powered quadcopter going out to explore. Oh, which moon? It titans, it Titan. titans lakes, I think, because it's going to like a dragonfly it goes from lake to lake. Um, and so it's sort of like a hopper. Yeah. And yeah. That's part of that is being designed um, at NASA Goddard. And um, it's there's just so many cool missions just, coming up. Just like, do, do, do people know that we're like planning to launch a nuclear powered quadcopter to a moon of Saturn? Like I, I didn't actually know. That. <laughs> so, yeah. Like like we're we're just working on some amazing stuff. We need to get someone on that project on the show, <laughs> by the way. I, yeah. that, that one, I think, is just so I don't know. It just sounds amazing. Oh yeah, there are just so many, so many cool missions. Yeah, coming up always that are on the horizon. You know, uh, mission concepts to go into lunar caves. They're just, you know, working on the Europa Clipper to land on Europa and try to save the subsurface oceans. It's like, you know, there are some something I think is really cool is sometimes in scientific papers, there's a person who wrote a j paper about subsurface oceans on, um, on Europa. And for funsies, they just put a giant squid in the image there underneath the ice. And it's like, we don't know. There's not, we don't, <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> and how cool is that? Like he might be right. We just have to go find out. We do. Yeah. Yeah. But back to your other question about concern is, um, I think one thing that always concerns me is that people don't understand the breadth of um, what NASA does and what it brings back um, to this country. It's seen as a frivolous expenditure when really NASA gets a half a penny for every single one of your tax dollars. It's so little. And yet, during the Apollo era, just from an economic, let's look at this economically. You know, a dollar that went into the Apollo program, the technology and everything that NASA designed to make the Apollo program possible, returned $7 into the U.S. economy um, because of all of the innovation that's required to do something that's never been done before. And now that dollar amount can sometimes go up to $40 for every dollar you put into NASA comes back. And so people see this as why are we spending money on the space exploration, all this stuff, but really what we're spending money on is using innovation to follow inspiration that can change our, our life right here on our own planet while learning something about somewhere else. Yeah, Apollo brought around so much cool technology that you know that was the 60s yeah. and it's changed life completely mm -hmm. now. Yep. And so I hope that, you know, we keep people can eventually start to understand that. And, you know, our government keeps funding stuff like that. And, you know, maybe even this is us using our technical aspect, technical people and non-technical people against all these career fields with a one common goal that can change our. And, you know, I think during the Apollo program, like 375,000 Americans worked on that program and it was just an amazing source of jobs and we can do that again. And so my concern is that that gets lost in the politics of um, money spending. The, the nice thing though, is there is something that like just the three of us can do, which is to keep having these conversations and make people aware like that one to seven yeah. value. Like I had no idea. It's just interesting to me that that we've even quantified it, but it makes so much sense, right? If you just mm -hmm. think about it, yeah, yeah, it's it's really impressive, and you know, not something that that people realize. But when you start talking about it, and you realize how much money we earn back with just such a little investment of our taxes, like imagine if NASA got a whole penny, like a whole penny from each tax dollar, we could do double and maybe even, you know, who knows what we could be doing. It seems like a no brainer. I know. <laughs> For me, I'm not even as worried about the economics of it. It's just that the fact of doing this accelerates the science and engineering of Definitely. our daily lives. You know, the mm -hmm. Apollo, they say, you know, they invented like Velcro and I wasn't microwaves, but like, you know, food preservation and new alloys for space technology. You know, we Definitely. wouldn't have our cell phones without that. You know, mm -hmm. Yep. You know, space 
you, you think now everything that we have is, you know, your Wi-Fi, your weather service, everything is all because of space exploration and the satellites and that technology. And it's just so important. And yet our entire daily life we get from our phone, which is, thank goodness for satellites. Mm -hmm. And most people have no idea. Yep. <laughs> that we're, we're probably relaying through a satellite through at least one link. The three um, of us would not be talking without satellites. Nope, definitely so, not. Yeah. yeah, amazing. We're we're nearing on our hour, which means we like to save the best question for last. We get a couple questions left. Excellent. All right, bring them on. Go ahead, James. Well, do we go with the fun one or the important one? So, you, so you do the important one. I'll do the fun one. What, what advice would you give to a young person who's interested in doing what you do? Yeah, I think that's um, never take the time to talk to people. Um, you know, there so many of the moments that I've gotten were just from taking a risk to talk to somebody more important than myself. And so, you know, a really good example is how I got. Um, to stay on the rover team as well as then got the job at MS at Malin Space Sciences with the Molly instrument afterwards. And that's because one day as at JPL, they're doing a test bed test to practice drilling with the Mars twin rover. And I was an intern and I went in there and I was like, where should I stand? And all these scientists are in there and I was like, I'm gonna go stand with all the really important people because those are the people who can explain to me more and just taking the moment to stand there and talk to them and ask questions. Um, there, there are always people willing to help someone who's trying really hard and takes the time to get to know them. And so I always use three questions. You know, when I'm getting scared and nervous about talking to someone new, um, there are three questions that I always come back to, which are pretty much the questions you guys ask me tonight, which are, um, how did you get to where you are? Um, and, you know, and you can always start talking about their history of education and their jobs. Um, the other one is what do you feel is your greatest achievement? Mm. And a lot of time people come back and they're like, do you mean in your job or in life? And I'm like, whatever you want. And there are people who say their kids, their families. And then, you know, you're talking to a man who won the Nobel Prize and his response is my ability to lead the spacecraft team was John Mathers and Dr. John Mathers answer. And that just leads to a whole bunch of conversations. And then this question right here, which is what advice would you give to someone like me trying to get from A to B? And having those three questions have allowed me to engage in so many conversations that have led to me to the positions and a lot of hard work. So it was how you, how you got where you are. Mm -hmm. Your greatest, your greatest achievement. achievement. And what advice would you give someone? Mm -hmm. Wow. I'm putting that in my back pocket. Yeah. Because I'm sometimes you're, you're just always standing there like, what do I say? What do I say? What do I say? And one of those always sparks a conversation. Well, let That's me tell you, we, we have a fourth question that you could add to this list. Because <laughs> yes, we, please. we have our favorite question to ask. This, this is John's favorite question. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we're, we're, we're asking everyone, what is your favorite pizza topping? So I'm almost surprised you guys might, do you guys already know this answer for me? Because I like the weirdest pizza. And I have definitely I forced you guys to eat this pizza before. But I oh, like now I pizza remember. with barbecue sauce. Oh, no. <laughs> with pineapple and banana peppers. No, really, this, <laughs> this, this question, there was a correct answer to the question. And it's not that. <laughs> I know it's never that, but I love it. <laughs> I remember this now because it was, at, it was at your wedding. It was like, oh, yeah, pizza time. And I go over and I'm like, this doesn't taste like tomato sauce. <laughs> no <laughs> way. There's barbecue else sauce on my here. wedding. <laughs> I held back and put chicken on it at the wedding instead of pineapple and barbecue and banana peppers. Well, that, well, that makes You're welcome. Meal. Yeah. That was Check meal. I could follow you all the way up to the banana peppers. I know yeah. we were John way back when you started. 
Well, John's, you know, a New Yorker. He has opinions. The, the correct answer is uh, tomato sauce with cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make him bully you like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not one to be rolled, steamrolled about things like that. <laughs> well, um, Marie, it, it's been a, a great talk. Do you have any uh, just last things you'd like to say to us or whoever might be listening out there? Um, just be excited, take the time to look at these new missions and just fall in love with space and find the way to do what you're passionate about and you'll get somewhere amazing. There you have it. All right. Well, uh, that's about all the time we have. Thank you, Marie. It's thank been you so great. much. It's, thank you, guys. This has been so much fun. Can can we already plan to have the sequel when you're on the moon? We can we can just we, yeah. we, we, we I'll can give you guys your talk. press your your press pass for that. All right, yeah. Just call you up on the moon. That'd be good. Yeah, yeah. That'll, that'll be the next episode we do with you. <laughs> Very good. All right, Marie. Thanks for joining us. Thank, thank you. you so much.